So hello YouTube. Um, I have got a PhD in chemistry and uh, it's been a while actually since I graduated. I graduated in 2011, I think. There it is, it doesn't even say the date on it. But I graduated in about 2011 and uh, it was a really fantastic time. I want to let you know that I actually graduated with a PhD from an Australian university. Um, Australia at the time when I was doing my PhD wasn't as intense as the stuff that I saw during my postdoc positions um, after my PhD. And there wasn't that same level of urgency and push and competitiveness. Um, but that's what I want to talk about today. These are the five things that no one tells you about when you start a PhD. If you're new to this channel and this is the first video you saw, remember to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell notification because I'm going to be putting out videos about PhD, about startup land, about content creation, everything that I've learned over the past 10 years and I'd love for you to consume all of it. All right, let's get on with the five things that I wish someone had told me before I started a PhD. So the first thing is, and probably it's the most important, is that your supervisor will determine how nice your PhD uh, time is. Now, I was incredibly fortunate because I didn't do a lot of research on my supervisor, but my supervisor was fantastic. Um, she was a seasoned professional when it came to helping students in the lab. Um, my supervisor always had time for me. My supervisor always had regular meetings with me. My supervisor always got my PhD and chapter revisions back to me incredibly quickly when I was writing my thesis. Um, but that isn't always the case. Um, I've heard that certain PhD supervisors expect a lot from their PhD students and that includes coming in on weekends, early morning lab meetings, um, and then also just being completely absent for the majority of their PhD. Um, and look, for some students that's absolutely fine. For some students people really like that they've got the freedom uh, and some people don't like to be micromanaged, but some people need micromanaging. So the compatibility between you and your PhD supervisor will completely determine how successful and fun and nice your PhD time is. So please choose wisely. The second thing is, is that it is incredibly competitive. Um, it's something that I wasn't completely aware of when I got into a PhD. Um, honestly, for me, it was a path of least resistance. I'm originally from the UK. I wanted to go to Australia. A PhD seemed to be the easiest thing. I did well in my undergraduate. Sure, why not do a PhD? Uh, in hindsight, not the best way to choose a PhD, but nonetheless, that was my path to doing a PhD. It's competitive on a number of levels. The first one is that it's competitive within your research group if you've got a large research group. I've even heard stories of supervisors employing two students on the same project and saying, whichever one gets me the result first gets a PhD. That is insane. That is a really horrible way to do any sort of PhD stuff. So yeah, I've heard of that and that was a lab in the US that I heard that happening. So yeah, it can be super competitive in the lab and with your peers. Um, there's always this thing about, you know, out-competing each other in terms of the amount of time that you've been at the bench, the amount of time you spend in the lab. So sometimes it's expected that you spend your life in the lab until you get your PhD. That is insane to me. You've got to balance work-life. But uh, yeah, some supervisors expect that you're there all the time. And also it's competitive uh, outside. So uh, the academic system rewards people for producing peer-reviewed papers. And that relates to your H-index. And H-index is the number of peer-reviewed papers you have with that number of citations. So my H-index at the moment is 11, which means even though I've got 14 or 15 papers, 11 of them have over 11 cites. Um, and that number, that H-index, will 
dictate your entire career. And if you give clever people a system to manipulate, they will manipulate that system and game it. Of course that will happen. And so that all feeds into the competitiveness. Um, people want a high H index. They uh, produce papers, they game the system, they get their name on papers that they didn't really contribute to. All of that is absolutely outrageous, but it's a reality of academia and doing a PhD. So the third thing that uh, I was unaware of and no one told me about was the fact that peer-reviewed papers are so very important and ultimately dictate whether or not you're successful in an academic career or not. When I was first starting my PhD in about 2007, no one told me that. So I just thought, sure, you turn up to the lab like you did in undergraduate, you do some experiments, you write them up. Um, I didn't even really understand what peer review was. Um, but that is a problem which now is the reversed, where you enter a lab, and I really feel like in the past about five to 10 years, it has got hyper competitive, super competitive, um, and if you're not publishing about three papers at the end of your PhD, um, it's really sort of frowned upon. And I've even heard people uh, say you should produce three papers a year during your PhD. Um, and yeah, it's insane. I'm not sure if that's even possible in a like in a academically rigorous fashion or whether or not you do genuinely have to uh, game the system. But the expectation to publish peer-reviewed papers is higher than ever. Some um, labs out of Hong Kong, I think I heard, uh, PhD students were coming out with like 11 to 20 papers, which, it, which is just insane. That, that's clearly not all their work. That's them getting their name onto other people's papers. That's, uh, yeah, just gaming the system as far as I can see. Uh, and it's an uh, unfortunate reality of academia and modern academia is that the peer-reviewed paper system maybe is a little bit flawed. It can be gamed and people are gaming it. I think there's, I'm not even sure people will care that much about fixing it. Um, but yeah, if you start a PhD, you have to be completely aware that these peer-reviewed papers are what determine your career trajectory and success. Nothing else really. Grant money. Let's talk about that. So another expectation of PhD students these days is that towards the end of your PhD, you will be applying for funding. Um, a PhD is the training ground for academia, but the issue is, is that uh, academia is largely run, or maybe I could even say heavily rel reliant, if not primarily reliant, on external funding to do research. And so not only have you got papers that you need to create, you've also got to start looking for grant funding. And funding is incredibly hard to get. Um, and it's a shame really, because I've seen so many awesome scientists who have done everything well. They have got papers, they've got uh, great track records, they've got a high H index, but unfortunately, they are not able to secure a grant because maybe their research isn't in a sexy area, it isn't in a hot area at that moment. And so grant funding along with papers can really dictate the success of your career after, after your PhD. Um, and also, if you're working for someone whose grant runs out, you will also just run out of a job. If there's no money, they won't be able to keep you. It's just insane. It's, it's a really weird system, um, but it's a reality of academia and something that people didn't tell me when I went into academia. You know, all of my friends and all of my family are like, wow, you've spent oh, 11 years in university now. You must be, you know, highly sought after and you must be earning an absolute fortune. And the answer is that you just don't. Like, you, your, your job security is even less than if you worked in government or in industry and you probably don't even get paid that much either. And, uh, yeah, it just doesn't correlate. You expect that if you go to the furthest ends of education that you are rewarded in some way with a permanent job or a job that pays you know, $200,000 a year, whatever it is. And it's unfortunately just not the case. So grant funding dictates 
your career as well as peer-reviewed papers. I wish someone had told me that. And the final thing that I wish someone had told me when I started a PhD is that it is hard to start something when you don't know really what the end is. There's an anxiety that I really can't explain. It's, you, you start a PhD and you know you have to get this thesis at the end, but it's kind of not like a medical degree or your undergraduate where you know after three years, you go, you jump through these hoops and you'll pass. Um, it's really heavily reliant on results, on papers, and it's not always clear that you'll get them. And so even in your sort of first, first year is kind of fun because, you know, you're learning new things, it's a new experience, you're getting paid more than you've ever been paid before to do science. And then at the end of your first year, you're in your second year and reality really hits and you're like, shit, in two years time, I've got to have a thesis. I've got to have novel results to report to impress my peers. Um, and that's where it really gets quite anxiety inducing just because it's only you that can do that. It's not like you can sit an exam or cram for a test or um, do anything like that. It is all about continuous persistence. It's about turning up every week, every day and adding a graph. And that was part of my uh, strategy in the end was, you know, at the end of this week, I'm gonna have another graph that I can talk about. Or at the end of this week, I'm gonna have synthesized this thing and have it analyzed. Um, that's the only way it will work, but there's lots of tiny steps to get there. And unfortunately in PhD land, uh, the end result of getting your thesis and having peer reviewed papers, um, you really have to focus on the, the, the small steps, you know, like today I'll do this and this, and you need to work towards that goal. And uh, it's incredibly anxiety inducing just because it doesn't feel like there's an end in sight. It doesn't feel like you're ever going to finish. Um, and, you know, I've known of people who have spent about 10 years doing their PhD. I've known of people that spend easily five years. Uh, I actually was classed as an international student, so I had to be done within three years. And that was a great motivator just because I had to be completed and I had to have my thesis and, and uh, not everyone has that pressure and it can really drag out because ultimately if you don't have the results, if you don't have uh, new, novel, interesting ideas or you haven't contributed to a field of research significantly enough to prove that you're worthy of the doctor title and a PhD, um, then you just, you just need to carry on. That kind of not having any strict boundaries and I think as scientists, we really enjoy, you know, working towards a, a, an exam or a goal or a thing, you know, we, we've perfected that. But what we haven't perfected is the art of working continuously every day towards a goal where the goalposts just kind of always shift and move. And um, that's really, really sort of challenging. And it, it's a complete mind shift from an undergraduate experience where you turn up to some lectures, you learn some stuff, you sit an exam, which you're obviously good at, um, and you do some lab work, boom. This is completely new. This is so, so new, such a new way of doing things. You're no, And also no one really cares about what you're up to in the lab necessarily. So you have to drive your own experience. You have to turn up every day. You have to be uh, persistent. You have to have really great sort of project management skills. And if you don't have them at the beginning, you're definitely going to have them at the end of three years. And there's so much to learn and so much internal motivation you need to have that, uh, yeah, that is something that was so different to anything I've experienced before. And I, even after sort of three to four years, you're not guaranteed to have those results that show you have contributed to a field significantly. Uh, and that can be incredibly anxiety inducing. Hmm. But it's a fun challenge, right? Okay, YouTube, that's the end of the five things that I wish someone had told me about before I started a PhD. Let me know in the comments what you would add to that list. Remember to subscribe to the channel, hit the bell notification so you get all my latest videos. And I hope that you make the right choice before starting your PhD. Take the time to understand the supervisor and the culture that you're entering and you can't go wrong.